Yeah, thank you, Josh. It is 33 minutes past the hour. It is the Jeff Santo Show that you're tuned into. I'm in Eli from the South Coast as we rock our way into the weekend. And again, folks, uh, for those of you who are uh, daily visitors to the Jeff Santo Show, we'll be off uh, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Return next Friday. I'm uh, going to do a lot of things behind the scenes uh, to improve the quality of the show, both content-wise, technically delivered, uh, and so forth. And uh, you're truly going to be involved in uh, a number of different elements of that and t- try to get some time off and uh, breathe a little bit, uh, help the folks, and so on and so forth. So, again, we'll be off Monday through Thursday. Best of the Jeff Santo Show will be in play. And uh, we will be back live on Friday with uh, a lot of our regular panel, including our next guest. He is the executive director of Democracy Watch News. He is a great musician. Check him out on YouTube. He is, uh, of course, our Friday man to end the week with. Uh, He's going to give us uh, a bunch of discussions about some of the bands, including my uh, old friends, the REM band from uh, the 80s and 90s, and Peter Buck. My God, I haven't heard that name in a while. He is the great MTC. Mark Taylor Canfield joins us with a yellow guitar. Mark. Yeah, I got to pump this one up because this is for Jimmy. Mark Taylor Canfield. Hello, hello. Uh, welcome to a Friday afternoon here on the Jeff Santo Show. You know, we may be the only progressive talk radio show in the country that ends with a guitarist that could be performing in any stage in this country, in MTC. We are lucky here on the Jeff Santo Show. Rather unique, well, I say. Jimmy just passed to, uh, his the anniversary of his passing was on the uh, 18th. So 18th I've been thinking of a lot about yeah. him. Yeah, he was, he was born in Seattle. And you know, you know I'm gonna have to write a song about him, but he was born in Seattle on November 27th, 1942. And most people don't know this, Jeff, but his real name when he was born he, on his birth certificate, it said Johnny Allen Hendricks. But in 1946, hmm. uh, his parents changed his name to James Marshall Hendricks. And that was in honor of Al and his late brother Leon Marshall. So he actually oh, wow. had a different name when he was born. Yeah. Let me ask you: but, Is uh, there a street named Hendrick Street or Way? Did they? Did they? The forefathers ever think of that? I mean, the guys are well, you know, the greatest guitarist of all time. Jimi Hendrix Memorial Park. Yeah, that's, that's where we. No street. Uh, he's a member. He's. Uh, He's his well, memory well, is they a, should name the street that the park is on, you know, Hendrix Street it, or it, Hendrix it Way actually, or it is it actually is? Okay. it's, it's right. also named after him. Kudos. But it's a it's a major place for protest. In fact, uh that and Judkins great. Park in the central district of Seattle. So when the Black Lives Matter protests were happening and when uh people were organizing every year and still are organizing every year for the Martin Luther King Jr. Day celebration that's where people would gather so Jimmy is alive and well in Seattle uh you know our our friends the Black Tones invoke him all the time uh Eva Walker their amazing singer and guitarist songwriter uh she told me that Jimmy was one of her biggest influences I gave her uh, I have a story I don't know if I told you this but I bought a record for her on her birthday because she was performing at KEXP with the band on their live room show, which is amazing, folks. You should check out KEXP's live room performances, especially the Black Tones, because it was brilliant. But it was Eva's birthday, so they actually have a record store in the radio station called Light in the Attic's Records, and it's a lot of vinyl. It was just some guy who had a little record store that got shut down, so KEXP brought him into their building and gave him a place to do his stuff. I bought a record of Jimmy 
performing with an avant-garde piano composer in New York City. I'd never heard of this. Wow. But towards the end, Jimmy was experimenting with a lot of different styles with jazz and fusion and with avant-garde music like this. So I wrote a note on the sleeve, you know, wishing her a happy birthday and a great show. And there was a guy there who who was talking to this woman, telling her about KEXP. I said, well, do you, you work here, right? He goes, yes. So I said, can you please give this to Eva or put it in her mailbox? Because she has a show at KEXP where she plays all local unsigned bands. And it's it's called Audio Oasis. And it's a jewel, folks. It's where a lot of bands get their break. But I said, can you leave it in her box for her and give it to her after the performance? I don't want to disturb her now because she's getting ready. He goes, sure. Turns out that guy didn't work for KEXP, even never got that record. That dude, whoever he was, was trying to impress the woman he was with, claiming that he worked there when he didn't. He took the record. <laughs> That's too that funny. Is, that is, that is that is too, too funny, my friend. Crazy story. Um, yeah. All true. Oh, man. Well, you know, here you go. No, Pete, um, right. You know. Yeah. Well, I have a song about him, but I can't um, sing it on your on the airwaves here because the lyrics are a little bit weird. The lyrics would be un unacceptable, so I won't put I won't say it. But uh, unfortunately, well, Jimmy died on September eighteenth, nineteen seventy, of barbiturates overdose uh, in London. Pills. But that was an interesting story too, because Keith Richards' girlfriend was one of the first people who actually noticed him. He actually got passed over by, by some other famous musicians at the time who, who were told about him and they went to listen to him and said, nah, this guy's crazy. I don't know what he's doing. But he, uh, Keith uh, Richards' girlfriend met him or saw him perform, said she was really moved by his music. She ended up uh, introducing him to the band and their uh, and producer actually decided, hey, I know somebody who was working with Eric Burden and the Animals who would really like to produce your stuff. Would you like to work with him? And that's how he got his big yeah, break in London. Have, it was uh, didn't those. he have a girlfriend in London, Hendrix? Was that I don't know if that's the same, you know, Hendrix, uh, you know, uh, Keith Richards' girlfriend. But you know, if I'm not mistaken, I, I've seen some movies on Ace. Hendrix, and and in those days, this is you know early 1960s, um, you know, black white, you know, w was still a thing, right? Um, and I, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, if, if there is a connection there to Richards or if it wasn't her, maybe one of her friends, um, you know, which of course brings the, the whole idea of how we, in the, how you guys in the music world are far ahead of the rest of society and how, you know, interracial marriages, interracial relationships, all those sort of things that happen, you know, in the community. And of course this was happening in the UK uh and so forth so yeah it, it's it's yeah. uh it's just an amazing career when you think of it and 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 some of the songs um you know uh, that are there i mean it's it's just great hey stuff joe was and, and you know big hit they produced hey joe and that that was a song that the producer for the for the animals heard and knew he could make a hit that's why he signed Jimi hendrix and i have it i was trying to find it in the studio to show you guys but I do have a gold record of Jimmy's 45 pressing of Hey Joe all framed and everything. So it's a it's an icon for me. But yeah, I mean, uh, there's a great movie starring Andre 3000, right? The the guy in mm -hmm. Outcast who did some great music. He is also a good actor. He was in Battle in Seattle about the WTO protester. So I got to meet him here and hang out with him. Got, he got me into the VIP party with him and Shirley Theron oh, and, and all VIP. that. Oh, VIP. Yeah. Some Not stories that. I can't really tell publicly right now, but <laughs> later in my memory. Yeah, but, you're gonna have to go and, off you know, Woody Harrelson was in that film, and he he loved Seattle's cannabis. So, you know, there was a lot of stuff going on. Oh, so yeah. Andre actually You know, he played, also lives in Costa Rica part-time, uh, part you know, right? What's Woody that? Woody Harrelson. He also lived oh, in yeah, Costa yeah. Rica for a while. Yeah. yeah. I have a good friend like who just moved there in medicine. Yeah, I'll, one of my best friends lives in San Jose right now in um, Costa Rica. He loves it down there. But the point was, is, is that, um, uh, you know, Jimmy uh, was discovered by some other people. He was kind of passed over by other folks. And that's what gave him his start. And I think um, that film with Andre 3000 that plays him does go into pre pretty good detail, bi a biographical detail about his relationship with that woman. Yeah, so he, you know, it was kind of startling at the time for some people, but rock and rollers were always, you know, a little bit 
not cut from the same mold as everyone else. I mean, we, we yeah. push the envelope yeah. sometimes. So I'm not surprised. I know in my experience of working with musicians in Seattle, I mean, some of my, my favorite musicians and some of my, uh, my favorite people to play with are from all sorts of different backgrounds and ethnicities. So it, I don't think musicians really have the same kind of barriers a lot of time. Not that there aren't some, you know, right wing musicians out there. There are, but most of the people I work with in Seattle are very open minded about people's gender identification or, you know, status or class in society, their ethnicity, whatever. It doesn't really matter. What we really love is the music. And Jimmy um, was the, the the progenitor, I think, of modern rock and roll. He really, I think if it wasn't for his acid rock, we wouldn't have heavy metal. We probably wouldn't even have punk because in his yeah. own way, he was kind yeah. of a punk. I mean, he set his guitar on fire for heaven's sakes. And one of them ended up being given to Frank Zappa because Zappa's son, uh, Dweezil, uh, pulled it out of from behind a staircase and took it to a shop down there in LA when I was down there and they fixed it up for him. Uh, but it was given by Jimmy to Frank Zappa. But the problem was is that he had set it on fire with lighter fluid. So it was all burned and charcoaled out. <laughs> so they had to fix it. Like the pickup didn't even work anymore. So Frank just yeah. put it behind hey, the, um, the store where he used it. But Jimmy liked I, to I give Stratocaster. I want, I want to get back to that. But, you know, you you uh, have been involved with Democracy Watch News for a while now. And you guys have been doing some stuff. And I, I was glad to see that the language, you know, that I and Harvey and Alan Minsky talk about, you know, the New Deal and, and uh, you know, the idea of the 21st Century uh, Economic Bill of Rights, that there is a journalism New Deal. So let's take a little break from um, our, our history lesson with, with Jimmy uh, Hendrix. And uh, talk to me a little bit about that, because that's something I know you've been concerned about. It, it involves, you know, reporters without borders and so on and so forth. Uh, what's the latest on that before we get back to uh, a little music stuff? Yeah, and I can tell you the story about this guitar. But OK, so Tom uh, Hartman and, and I talked about this on his show earlier today. It's a story that nobody else is really covering. And if I hadn't, you know, contacted his producer, they wouldn't have covered it either. But it's the Summit on Democracy and Information and it took place at the United Nations in New York City. And for a journalist or executive director for Democracy Watch News, it was a huge deal for me. Of course, for the rest of the country, they're, you know, they're too busy worrying about you know, what Trump had for breakfast or whatever. So right, I, right. I find it frustrating that you know, I'm not surprised considering that Reporters Without Borders ranks the United States 42nd in the world in terms of press freedom. And then that's not because of state-run media like in Iran right now or something. It's because the corporate uh, entities uh, and interests control the all of the information that you get. So you're not going to hear much about this because it's not considered sexy. It's not going to sell advertising. I keep telling our group, we, Democracy Watch News, we got to find a way of make, making democracy as sexy as rock and roll. Then, we'll, you know, then we can get people's attention. But it took place yesterday. Uh, the keynote speaker was Nobel Prize winning uh, journalist Marie Ressa from the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And the big news yeah. is that, oh, and it was sponsored uh, or co-sponsored by the, the the nation of France and Reporters Without Borders, hmm. which actually originally was headquarters and still is headquartered in Paris. So uh, the keynote speaker. I got to get myself to Paris, man. Yeah. Oh, I love I just, that city. You know, my I've been to London many times, but I I, I got to get to Paris. It's a it's a bucket list. It's going to be better uh, music uh, in, in London, but better music in London. Yeah. But I I love French culture. But anyway. <laughs> the big news is that the United States has just joined with 46 other countries in this partnership called the Information and Democracy Partnership. And what it is, is it's Great featuring stuff. some brand new initiatives that they um, have been working on for the last few years. This all started in 2019. But at this conference yesterday, they brought forth these proposals, including what's being called the New Deal for Journalism. And that's featuring this thing called the, Trust, the Joint Trust uh, Initiative, the JTI. And that's an effort to combat the societal chaos and misinformation that all these infodemics are causing. You know, something we've obviously seen affecting U.S. politics with the false information about the 2020 election being, you know, fostered by the Trump crime family and their supporters in the Republican Party. So uh, Joseph Stiglitz helped write some of the guidelines for this effort. A, a great man, oh, wow. by the way, um, that I had yeah, the honor no, of meeting fantastic. at a town We've been trying to get him on Seattle. the show, actually. Uh, great, great economist, and um, yeah. you know, just, just uh, understands and, it. Um, you know, let me ask you about something. Be yeah, no doubt. Um, let me let me just say this because we were talking about this with uh, with our previous guest, John Shelton, great professor, 
uh, at UWGB, of course, Harvey and, and even Harold Meyerson. Um, I really think, Mark, and, it, and it's your second profession or first profession, however you look at it, you're a great reporter and a, and a, and a fantastic musician. Um, I really think that it, it's going to be, and the, the comparison that I made was as a college student in the 1980s, I'm a little bit older than you, but to me, you know, what Live Aid did, you know, with Queen and, and, and the Stones and Geldof and U2 and all that, um, of course, Geldof putting it together, you know, what put a focus on poverty and famine in, in Africa, right? I mean, I don't think a lot of Americans, and for that matter, probably Europeans too, understood what was going on uh, there. And I'm thinking with the democracy at stake, and we're talking about Wisconsin, we're going to be on in Wisconsin. In fact, we're going to be on, we're going to be off for the next four days preparing for that, coming back on the 3rd of October, although we'll be on next Friday, and we'll look forward to talking to you then. But, you know, I think whether it's, a lot of live aid type of deal, which you could put together, you know, in October. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, Geldof didn't have a lot of lead time to put together live aid and he did it in two cities simultaneously, which is pretty amazing. Um, you know, Phil Collins filing in the Concord to go to both, uh, both venues in London and Philly. But, um, you know, I, I think that that music is really one of these things that could do it. Um, and because, I mean, look, if you're a musician, and again, I understand that rock and roll is, doesn't have the same impact that it did in the 60s with Woodstock or it did in the 80s with Live Aid, but it still has an impact. And whether, whether you in, in, in make it a more diverse uh, group of people playing, you know, in, you know, it, whether you have to sort of, you know, look at, uh, at, at, at Lamar and whether you have to look at, um, you know, Jay-Z and whether you have to look at, um, you know, bringing in you know, an older Rolling Stones, whatever, with Bruce and Vetter and so on. But to me, if you really want to make a difference and get young people and people, you know, in general, you, you need to put together something like that. Because frankly, I don't think people in Washington talking to the average Joe or the average Jill, they, they, that's going to do it. I think the Republicans have enough um, a volume on radio, on on Fox TV, and online to basically say, oh well, you know, don't believe all that stuff. You know, we just need to get somebody better who can handle the economy and everything else. Do, do your own thing. I think we need to really make a difference, and that's that's why I'm wondering because you and I have been talking about a Springsteen or a Vetter presidency. Well, you know, between now and November eighth we need to get people engaged to come out and vote. Otherwise you're going to have places like Wisconsin that could have a, a fascist state. They already have, you know, people gerrymandering districts in the house and Senate there or the assembly in Senate. And you could, you could have a governor there that's right wing and it's a lunatic place. If you had that scenario, I mean, the whole state could go to hell in a handbasket and we have a lot of great friends, a lot of great contributors, you know, who will, who will be muffled. You know, Harvey, Robert Craig, uh, Shelton now. I mean, so anyways, I was wondering what you think about yeah. that, because, you know, you're involved in both worlds. Well, definitely musicians need to step up um, between now and 2024. It's a very important time in American history, and we have to stave off this uh, attempted uh, fascist takeover uh, at the national level as well. Yeah. Now, you know, hopefully Trump's legal troubles will will be the demise of his crime family. But but in the meantime, we we really need to think about this one issue, which is so important, um, and that's voting rights. So I love the work that Greg Palace is doing. I think I've, um, I think we're pretty much convinced at Democracy Watch News that that should be our focus between now and 2024 is voting rights as a major uh, obstacle to democracy in this country. Because in other countries, you know, we were talking about this because we have uh, weekly uh, uh, Twitter space events where we invite correspondents from around the world to talk about what's going on in Africa, right. Central and South America. And some of those countries, I mean, people literally show up at the polls with guns and point them at you if you try to vote. Uh, in this country, yep. they redistrict you. They uh, they uh, ex they take your name off of the voting rolls. They deregister you. Uh, they do all of these underhanded things. And uh, and obviously, the gerrymandering, you know, is a major issue, part of that picture. So. When we looked at the major threats to democracy within the next couple of years, uh, that be that became apparent to us that that was the main threat. You know, we also have to deal with these issues of freedom 
of the press, which I spoke about, and all sorts of other issues um, that are civil rights and human rights issues. But this this issue with voting rights is the paramount issue. So I'm definitely going to try to, um, to use my time and music to focus on that issue. I will definitely be talking about it at the shows that I do, and I'm going to be trying to convince some of my other friends to do it as well. I know folks like Eva Walker, even Cedric Walker with the Black Tones, they're going on a national mm -hmm. tour right now with what is the name of that band that's me first and the gimme gimmies that's the name of the band they're touring with which i think is kind of funny <laughs> but are, me first and the gimme gimmies i like that well i know that they, from, they the satirical on the on the i i i i all about me you know iphone yeah. generation so you know there you go yeah and and i think you know eva understands that she you know a few of their songs are pretty political because they can't avoid it especially being people of color in this in this culture right now so yeah. Uh, oh, by the way, I should mention, um, not only are they, are they on a national tour, like which is from everything from Portland to New York City, they're also, um, Eva is also featured in Macklemore's new video. So that's going to be huge. It's it's a it's a new video that he just released. And uh, just somebody like, like her being featured uh, in a Macklemore video in, in itself. She's such a kind of a... a open-hearted warm kind of person and doesn't really go for the whole rock star kind of attitude that a lot of people in the music industry do so i'm really glad to see that um that he decided to choose her i think she's getting a lot of recognition the black tones by the way also jeff i'm telling you the super stories here they just played at the seahawks game serious they played oh, wow. at the game uh um they the seahawks actually asked them to perform so they're That's big fantastic. here. I mean, everybody loves them. Yeah. They, you know, got we the only got a couple of minutes. I want to I want to get out. Have the Mariners, because they're in the playoff chase, almost guaranteed to make a spot. Hopefully they'll get home field because you get all the, you know, all five games or potentially that uh, there, um, you know, or all three games, I guess it is. But, um, you know, is it um, is it a scenario where people are just not, it's just not a, a pink hat thing people are excited because they're good? But are, are they really energizing people? Because, you know, that, that the idea of sports or athletics in general, you know, gets people, you know, engaged, you know, gets you con concerned, uh, connected to the community. Um, is that yes. happening now? That's great. Yeah, as I've been saying, um, the Seattle Mariners have been bringing more people out to the ballpark than the New York Yankees. So we are really, you know, we've had crowds of over 30,000, which is, you know, crazy for baseball unless it's a World Series so yeah, people are really supporting them. People are really, really hungry for a winning team because it's been so long. So we all feel like we deserve it. <laughs> and so we definitely <laughs> yeah. want to support. Yeah, it's been a long time a since the since the like, 2001 yeah. and before that, the mid nineties. Yeah. Remember that those Griffey damn and Yankees. Yankees. Yeah, I'm, my fingers crossed, those damn Yankees. That's right. Well, the yeah, Yankees are not so weekend. good this year. So hey, not so much, well, right? I mean, where are in the playoffs? Runners? They're not as good as Houston. Yeah, that's for not, sure. That's a good thing. They're not as good as they as they were before. And I didn't think they were going to make yeah. the playoffs because they were losing. <laughs> the Mariners they were. beat them. Yeah, yes. yeah, they were. They were yeah, having Red hard Sox times. And, you know, and they blew a game last night. We got no bullpen. Blame it on Mr. Bloom. Um, hey, uh, you know, I, I, it, it's just so great. We didn't get to Peter Buck. Um, I haven't heard that name. I was a huge REM fan in the 80s and 90s. I still am, but I mean, not as much. Um, you know, so that's great. The Crocodile Bar, I think, was what you sent me. What's what's the deal with that? The Crocodile is one of the most famous music clubs in Seattle. It's one of those places where you can get up right next to the stage and see your fa favorite performer. Uh, Peter Buck heard about this band here called the Young Fresh Fellows, which all the musicians here know about. He loved them. Mm -hmm. So he and his girlfriend were out here and she... She invested in this club, so he's got a lot there going on there. Uh, great music scene in Seattle. We were there the other night. So much cool things happening. Check me out on YouTube. Check out our podcast, Democracy we'll Cast, do. for watching news. Thanks, Jeff. Hey, Have a great thank weekend. Thank you, man. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you next Friday. Uh, I want to thank uh, Josh and the gang in Boca Raton for producing this broadcast. Help Freddie Santori and company. Again, folks, off Monday through Thursday, back on Friday. Have yourself a great weekend, a great week. My name is Jeff Santos. Right now, it's my time to say I gotta go.